the Lord. I'm glad to be standing here one more time before you all. I trust that God has uh, been keeping all of us safe and uh, and joyful in the spirit. Um, uh, I'm going to turn to uh, Acts chapter 20. And Minu spoke last from this chapter. I'm going to uh, start with the verse that he had referenced, which is verse 24. But none of these things move me, neither count I my life dear unto myself, so that I might finish my course with joy and the ministry, which I have received of the Lord Jesus to testify the gospel of the grace of God. So, uh, so we've come to this point where we've reached about two-thirds uh, through uh, the book of Acts. And Paul is in a place, in an uh, island called Miletus, and he is passing through that place, and he goes through uh, Miletus, and he called uh, the elders of Ephesus, and he wants to meet them one more time because he was going, passing through there to go to Jerusalem. And he was so close with them, he established a church, and he spent, he says this later, uh, spent three years in Ephesus, building up that church and establishing the elders and, uh, you know, uh, uh, speaking to them all the things that he had learned about the kingdom of God. And he wanted to see the elders again because he knew he was not going to see them again. Uh, one more time, so he, because he knew he was never going to see them again. Uh, but he wanted to go to Jerusalem and uh, to, uh, to honor the day of Pentecost there. So, so he gives this message, and as Minu noted, this is, a, uh, I believe, the last uh, written sermon uh, of Paul when he was a free man. And so... He gives all these encouragement. He says, you know, I'm going to uh, Jerusalem, but the Holy Spirit has spoken to me through many people in different ways. And, um, and I've been told that I, I'm going to be uh, in, uh, imprisoned. I'm going to go through horrible persecution. But that's when he says this, yet all these things don't move me. I don't count my life dear and uh, so that I might finish my course with joy and my ministry. So he is saying, I am not shaken with anything that will happen to me or is going to happen to me. He didn't care about whatever danger was in ahead of him. He was going to do what God had ordained him to do. And that's what he was telling the elders. And he encouraged them. And he says, after I leave, you know, uh, the grievous wolves are going to come into your midst and try to take away believers. All these false teachers are going to rise up amongst yourselves and going to take turn people away. And he said, watch and pray how I, with three years, I warned everyone with tears. Um, and he goes on to say, and he encourages them, and he even says, I coveted no man's silver or gold or apparel. He's saying, I didn't want anybody's riches. I didn't desire them. I don't want your gold or your clothes or anything. But with my own hands, I ministered to my needs and for those who are with me. And uh, so then they all kneeled down together and cried and wept and said goodbye to Paul because they knew that they were not going to see uh, him again. So with that, I just wanted to give the context. And so with that context, um, what you notice there <coughs> is the one thing that stood out to me is uh, Paul's perspective uh, which was an eternal one. What, you, what is evident there is that he was f super laser focused on eternity. He was only worried about finishing what God had done, uh, given him to do on this earth. So it didn't matter what happened to him while he was on this earth. He was focused on getting to eternity and bringing others there. And that is what stood out to me as, as I read this sermon, is that is what he cared about. That's the lens with which he looked at everything. Uh, his love for others, 
his ministry, his, uh, all the things that he said was only to br- bring focus to eternity. And as we are here, uh, this is my last sermon for this year, um, and I just wanted to kind of reflect back um, on the <clears throat> last two years, how God has been faithful, but also caused many of us to reevaluate, reexamine uh, the things that are valuable to us as we went through a time of the pandemic together. Worldwide, I mean, whether you're Christian or not, everybody uh, ha- you know, has evaluated whether it is the imminent uh, uh, death because of uh, a disease that was spreading quickly or because we were forced to be locked down or whatever, uh, all of us had a chance to reflect. And um, what I've come down to is we, uh, we, ha- we need to come back to that perspective that Paul had. Is uh, So as we coming down to 2021, moving on to the next year, these are just arbitrary demarcations that are man-made, uh, right? But still, we, we are people, so these are valuable to us, uh, the, you know, year-end and all these things. But, uh, but let us come back and remind ourselves, is our perspective an eternal one, or is it focused on, uh, you know, just having a good life here, right? And that's what I wanted to remind us of. So, so what does the Bible say? Um, about our life. So, it just I, I know we only read these passages when there's a funeral, but we should really reflect on them when we are alive, rather than when somebody's died, right? So, so uh, if you go to the next slide, so uh, Psalm 90 is a passage that we should read often, um, whether you're young or old. Uh, read and reflect on this passage. Keeps us grounded and helps us to understand. Um, uh, uh, and uh, understand who we are and uh, where God's place, uh, 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 how we should view ourselves, right? And Psalm 190, verse, I'm going to just read Psalm 90, uh, verse 5 and 6. Uh, just the last part of 5. In the morning they are like grass which grows up. In the morning it flourishes and grows up. In the evening it is cut down and withers. And again, I'm going to read also in Psalm 103, verse 14 to 16. He knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. As for man, his days are as grass, as a flower of the field. He flourishes, a wind passes over it, and it is gone. And the place thereof shall know it no more. Just quite uh, powerful words that we hear all the time, but, you know, we hear it so many times. Back in Psalm 90, it says, uh, verse 9, it actually says, For all our days are passed away in thy wrath. We spend our days, years as a tale that is told. So the psalmist is saying, we know Moses wrote Psalm 90. Uh, psalmist is saying that, um, you know, we are just like grass. You know, we all have lawn. You know, it grows up overnight, and then we take a lawn mower and cut it down, right? And he's looking back. Uh, at his life, and he's saying, we're just like grass that comes up one day, and the sun beats down and withers and goes away, right? And, um, and in James chapter 1, verse 10 and 11 says, but the rich he, in that he's made low, because of the flower of the grass, he shall pass away. For the sun is no sooner risen with a burning heat, but it withers the grass, and the flower fadeth thereof. And the flower thereof falleth, and the grace of the fashion of it perishes. So shall the rich man fade away in his ways. So he's saying, it doesn't matter if you're rich or poor. It is just like grass in God's eyes. So I just used this, I brought this bottle to illustrate. So if, if our life is, you know, you're born, you know, and you're starting here, right? You have maybe 10, 20 years, 30 years. You have a lot of life left over, right? And you... Uh, 30, 40, 50, maybe you reach 100 years old, and, and you know, in our own eyes when we are young, it looks like, wow, 100 years old, that's old, dude, right? Or when you're, when you're 20, you're like, wow, 40 uh, feels really old. Uh, by the way, I'm over 40. Uh, so see, all my looks at me, wow, that's an old dude. Uh, <laughs> so, but I'm, when you're 40, you're like, oh, man, 60, wow, that's really old. And then the 60-year-olds are thinking, wow, 80, wow. If I can make it to 80, that's wonderful, 
right? So that's why Moses says, um, <clears throat> it says what? How long is man's life? Maybe 70 if by reason of strength, that if you are a, an extraordinarily healthy person, maybe you'll make it to 80. Or today's advancement of medical science, you can make, make it to 100, no problem, right? Life expectancy is increasing, right? And all of these things uh, remind us that, but in God's eyes, it just looks like grass. It comes up one day, the sun shines on it, it withers and it's gone away, right? And in fact, in James, the passage you read that God is looking, so, and then when we look at people in our lives here, and we look at rich people and say, wow, so uh, people that we admire, you know, successful people in this world, and, and we want to be like them, right? And we strive all our lives, spend all our energy and all our passion on being, uh, you know, wealthy and successful in this world uh, to get things that we don't have. And God is saying, reminding us in James, and the rich people are actually, maybe they stand up on top of the grass like this flower, like, have you all seen dandelions? How many of you have seen dandelions? Right, little weed flowers that grows on the grass. God is saying that it's just, to me, if you're rich in this world, it's just like these dandelions. It's, the wind comes and it blows it away. It means nothing for God. And God is reminding us from an eternal perspective that all the things that we are so passionate and care about and live our entire lives to fulfill those desires, it just blows away in, in a moment, right? We are, even if you live, whether you live to 20 or to 100, right? It just could be over in a moment. Or we might live to 100 and think that we have a wonderful long life, which is a good thing to desire. I'm not against that. I, I'm just kind of bringing us back to an eternal perspective. It's, oh, but in God's eyes, it's just like grass that withers, right? But if you look at, the eternal perspective, what does it say in verse 4 in Psalm 90? For a thousand years are in thy sight. Yesterday is past, and I watch in the night. So this bottle, if you look, put it in an ocean like this picture. If you, this, it's merely but a drop in the bucket. You look at, if you've been to the ocean side, you see the vastness of the ocean. All our entire life, even if you live to a hundred, is a drop in the bucket compared to the eternity that is to come. You all with me? It is nothing. We, so that's why God calls us and reminds us to live for the eternity that is to come. It's remind, don't be fools. Don't live your whole life to make this part of your life better and then at the expense of the eternity that lies before us. The vast ocean that lies before us, we, don't get, we can't guarantee tomorrow or next second, right? We might be cut down here or here or here. It doesn't matter. I can't predict the future. But make sure the life in eternity is secure. That you built up a rich of wealth, richness of wealth in this vast ocean we're about to experience. Whether it's in 10 years or 100 years. Uh, is a life built to build uh, 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 built around in this world built around building up riches in eternity and that is what our focus should be so whether you're young as a 10 or 20 year old or old like a 40 or a 60 year old or an 80 year old it's just perspective but can we focus on the eternity, the vast ocean that is before us. And that is the challenge. And that's what Paul is saying. That I don't count my life as anything. It doesn't matter if I have to suffer for Christ. Because my joy and my treasure is laid up in heaven. That's why Jesus said what? Store your treasures in heaven. Where no thief can break in and steal. Nobody can take that away from you. If you are in Christ. Nobody can take eternity away from you. If you're in Christ. Yes, you might lose your life here through to any different reasons, but nobody can take your life from in Christ from you. That's why in Romans 8 it says, Who can separate us from the love of Christ? Nor height, nor depth, nor famine or distress or persecution, nor any rulers or any power in this world can separate us from the love of Christ. 
That's why we are more than conquerors. As we sang, J.M., J.M., hallelujah, we're more than conquerors. He wants us to be conquerors and overcomers for Christ. What are we overcoming? Yes, we're overcoming tribulations and trials and sickness. We're also overcoming our fleshy desires. He wants us to take the nails and crucify ourselves to the cross daily and follow him and crucify the desires of our flesh because this vast ocean is before us. If we have to question our lives every day. Where am I going to be in this vast ocean? How is my life going to be? We have to reflect on our lives constantly and take stock. How do we measure up against that? I'm going to keep going. Uh, so, with, so we often, uh, so next slide, please. So, you know, that's why we look at just modern Christianity. You know, so built up around getting success and wealth here and making sure we're safe and secure and there is no glitch that could happen to our lives in here, right? We lived in our gated communities, you know, you know with insured, everything that everything's protected, no glitch. If anything that happens shakes us a little bit, we're so distressed, right? I mean, again, we're, we're all the same way. I, I'm no different. And we're so secure but and on the and the people that uh, the Hebrews talks about the heroes of faith, you know they they strove for their whatever they believed in, and they died without receiving the promises, and they saw them far away, right? Just like the vast ocean of eternity, and they but they were persuaded of them. They per, they were persuaded of these things that they believed in, and they embraced them and they confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. They knew that they were in this world but for a moment, right? And they, were conf and they were persuaded of them, they embraced them, and they confessed of them, and many times died for that belief, right? Look at how, you know, we, we want to preach about Abraham's riches, but if you look at the New Testament, the New Testament does not talk about Abraham's riches. He talks about Abraham's faith, right? We focus so much on Abraham's riches, but that's not what God mattered to God because it was just like the dandelion. It goes away. But he saw his faith, which was faith so strong, he was ready to sacrifice his own son because he believed in God so much. Because he looked, if you read in the uh, Hebrews, it says that he looked for a city that was built by God, right? And this world was not worthy of them. He looked for that eternity, this vast ocean that was before him. And this is vast ocean is what I wanted to remind us of, right? Uh, so if you go to the next slide, this uh, parable that Jesus said, I'm not going to read it, but we all know this in Matthew 13, is the kingdom of heaven is like unto a treasure a hidden appeal. When a man found it, he hid that treasure and he had so much joy, he went and sold everything he had, and he went and bought that field. See, this is the price it takes. Everything that we have is required to buy this treasure in Christ. To be part of that vast ocean in Christ, it takes everything of us. To get that treasure. This is what we're asking. And we can't be like the Laodicean church, right? What did Christ, when Christ was giving messages to all the seven churches, he spoke to the Laodicean church and he said, oh, you look uh, like you don't need anything. You have riches and you have wealth beyond what you need and you think that you don't need anything from me, uh, from Jesus. But he's saying, but, but when I look at you, I see that you're blind and miserable and wretched and poor because they were focused on making sure they're good for this part of their life. This part of their life will dissolve into that vast ocean as we saw earlier. And this will be just a drop in the bucket. But God is asking, when he sees us, are we seeing a blind, miserable, wretched people? Or are we seeing people that is so rich in Christ? What do we yearn for? All, our, you know, all the things that we desire, is it just to make our life here better? That's the question we have to ask ourselves. All the things that we crave, 
or you know, we look at all our life is built around you know social media and all these things are dis- uh, make us to lust after things that make our life here better, to be better than other people. But God is saying all those things are just like those dandelions. It just flies away in the wind. He looks at our life, this part of our life, and says it's like grass is going to wither away. But one thing is secure, and the worship team, please come forward. <clears throat> one thing is secure is that vast ocean before us. It is life in eternity. So, and, and when we go through suffering, when we go through sickness and distress, we don't have to be discouraged. Because all that is building an eternal weight of glory. That weight of glory is so great that everything that we go through in this world for the sake of Christ is not in vain. In Revelation, there is this, uh, I wasn't going to say this, but uh, in Revelation, uh, I believe it's in 7 or 8, I can't remember now, when he's going through all the different judgments, there's, so Jesus uh, opens the sixth seal, and before the seventh seal, the angel takes this incense and says it's the prayer of the saints, right? And he brings it before the altar of God. And um, one thing that reminds us is that everything that we pray, whether we receive an answer or not, God is hearing. It is in his presence, it's at his altar. So, God, so the angel takes all the incense to the prayers of the saints and brings it to the altar of God. And he takes this with fire, uh, the incense with, uh, mixed with fire and throws it down on the earth as a judgment against the earth world because of the prayers of the saints. So don't think our prayers and our groaning and our suffering is in vain. It is in God's presence. But all of these things are just to bring us to pr- have a perspective on eternity, on this vast ocean that is before us. That don't focus on the drop of, in the bucket or in the ocean. But let us turn our focus before that vast ocean. May His name be glorified.